Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me in this session. I am really happy. This is my first time in uh, Hamburg. And this is also my first time that I'm in a cinema and I'm actually here instead of watching a movie. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. But yeah, um, I want to talk to you about design. And I know that this can be a bit different according to the other talk that we have today. But I'm pretty sure that in the end, at least you're going to have some uh, nice um, opinion and some idea of uh, what is going on right now with design because I don't know you, but I noticed that design is changing a lot. The way that we are doing design, the way that we are thinking about design. My first paid job in, te in tech was in 2007 and I wasn't even 18 and the time the web, this thing called the web was pretty, pretty different. How many of you were around in 2007? Just for see. A few before? Basically, more or less the same people. And, uh, and so you kind of, I think you kind of remember that at the time when we were starting thinking about um, digital and we think about the web, we have this, this idea of mind of something that should be, um, should be as similar as possible, as, as close as possible of the real environment. 10 years ago, everything in the web looked like a newspaper, a magazine, we were really trying to reproduce. And actually, as we know, HTML and, uh, and then CSS was, was designed, was, was made with this idea of mind to reproduce document. And that's what we try to do. And I made something and, you know, we were like looking for really uh, textury heavy stuff. And I'm not a proud of it right now, but I remember that at the time, you know, that. That was looking cool. It was 2007, and as I say, right now the sun has changed, and it's changed. It is still really changing a lot. And this talk for this creamer is basically the results of a lot of conversation that I have with this with guy over here, who's pretty huge on the screen, kind of intimidating. And um, it's a sort of talk fork right now. But back in the days, back in 2007, we both used to work. Um, in Rome, having a small agency, working for clients, figuring out how can we uh, make the most accessible website, the most fast website using WordPress. Um, it's now, as I said, a consultant here in Germany. And as you already know uh, from my bio, I'm working on a product. But we were discussing and we noticed that even if our industry is, ch is changing a lot, we kind of still have this um, industrial mindset, together with the, with the look and feel coming from a different era, we were also stalling the same mindset, the same way to work, and apply to it. So we used to frame, ideate, and then having the specification ready before the production and distribution was able to start. And this is actually coming from um, an era uh, a long time ago where things were pretty different. So you have to be sure that here you have everything ready because having a product recall is going to be bloody expensive. Uh, OK, I think that this was a good introduction. So it's time for probably introduce myself. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Emanuela, and I'm working as a designer for um, Mozilla Firefox, and as you can maybe notice from my accent, I'm not German, <laughs> and I'm actually from Italy, but I'm living in Berlin since three years now, and I kind of, I kind of like here. Um, just a few words on Firefox. Firefox is in Germany is actually the first browser. Even if since I'm here, I, I saw a lot of people kind of uh, digging a bit on Firefox. It's pretty cool, and. We just launched uh, on Monday our new uh, beta release with this new thing that we call it Firefox Quantum. Quantum is just basically a code name, but what did happen is that we rewrote part of the um, of the backend and we redid we we work a lot on the UI. So Firefox is actually faster, feels better, and if you're curious, just really uh, download beta or 
I guess that most of people here are developers, so just try the developer edition. It's pretty good, like the dev tools have a neat uh, grid inspector. And what I'm doing in Firefox, in Firefox I'm working for the design system team together with other few people. And um, our design system is called Photon, and we are going to see a bit more about it later. The markets are hard to predict, because they're really unpredictable, and this is actually a constant when we're thinking about uh, digital markets, right? Um, we know that people's behaviors and expectations change continuously, and making something that is stable is incredibly hard, right? And most importantly, today, everything in software, six of ten uh, company of six of the top ten companies in the world are actually tech company. Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, and uh, Alibaba, if you were curious. And that means that we are surrounded about software, but we still uh, applying that like really rigorous mindset that we saw before coming from the industrial era, even if software is easy to, say, to change. This is actually, I think, the most important characteristic of software. They have way less friction in comparison to a uh, digital product. And as I was say before, if you're thinking about recall a product, like if your IKEA bed is broken, by default, by design, they have to recall the product, and that goes to cost a lot of money in terms of PR, in terms of um, giving you the money back, giving you a new bed. But if we're thinking about recall something in software, well, that's actually pretty easy. We can ship a bug fix, or um, going back to the previous backup, and we're kind of okay. And I know this kind of hard to say because I mean, we are all like developer, we are all working with code and we say like, it's not easy, it's not easy at all. But we have to admit that in conference to a uh, physical world, it's not that hard. And that's actually what I'm really like interested about software is the reason why I started to work in this industry is because we need to improve and we, need, we always need to train our capacity to adjust and change our plan. As creators of digital products, our attention should be directed to our flexibility and resilience. And we need production, we need product that can be rapidly adapted to the emerging needs of the market. Because most importantly, what is really changing right now is that the user needs are so complex and are so evolving because the market around us is is crazy. Like we, we ever see just before, like APIs coming all the way and it's really hard to predict what the user wants and what they have in mind. That's why I want to suggest to you today to rethink the way we create digital products and services, to rethink in general the way that we are designing. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with this sentence or like especially probably the guys who were like around since a while. I heard a lot of time people say, oh, doing software, building software, it's just like building an house. Well, it's not, because if you mess up your, your house, you have to call your architect, they have to destroy everything and reproduce everything from scratch. While, as, they say, as we said before, like, it's, n it's not like that for software. And again, we, we have this idea of the factory. I also, I love this expression, like feature factory, because right now everybody's agile, everybody's working in a really small way that sometimes it's kind of resemble this, right? We have our marketing uh, department or sales or whatever, just grab it with me, there's a magnificent new idea. And they go to the stakeholders, like we have this new idea, it's amazing, it's going to uh, earn us a lot of uh, new clients, so we're going to match our work, all the KPI. It's just a bit expensive. So the stakeholders, they're like, mm, maybe we can change a couple of things here. They review the budget, and they're, they're ready. They call that product manager. The product manager review the plan. He write the user stories all by their own. Like, OK, I have my user stories ready. Now I can call the design team. Designer, design. And they do it. And if we are lucky, they maybe have some um, 
um, you have a user research team in house, they can help you, or you hire somebody else, but we don't have time, we don't have uh, enough energy, we need to move on. So in the end, we have the specs. Maybe we did a couple of usability tests, but we have it, the specs are ready, and we can give it to the developers. Developer, build the stuff. And they do, like, they go there, they go to the specs, and we finally have the final product. It's there, it's ready to meet our users. That's, I mean, that's not great, right? How many of you have ever been in this situation? Basically, all the room. That's so sad. Because you know what happened, right? It happened that when you have this kind of um, process at some point, probably when the designer just pull over the, the specs to the developer and they're going to it, it's like, mm, I think we are missing some, uh, some edge case here. Or this is really good and I'm glad that uh, everything went well during the user research, but it's really uh, killing our performance. We need to do some adjustment. But the problem is that if we have this linear way to work, probably the design team is going to be, is, is really busy, right? So it's already on another project, and what it's going to do is just thinking something on the spot and give it back to the developer and say like, okay, okay, that's, that's what you have to do, with, that's fine. And this is creating a lot of conflict because um, there is this idea of designer most of the time that they want to have it super control on the final product and then they look at the spec, they look at the final product, look at the spec, and they're like, two pixels are off, <laughs> okay? And that's even worse, you know, when actually the problem appear when we ship it, when the user have it. Our final user, the, the people where we are doing all of this, they come to the product and they don't like the feature, they have problems. We miss the right timing, that that may happen. So the cost of change with this kind of uh, set and uh, environment is really high. And more we move in this process, more is going to be higher. And that's, that's really messy, and I hope that we can find a way to fix it. I think one of the, one of the main reasons why that process over there is really messy is because we still have this idea of design as the act of plan, and most importantly, the act of plan, um, the future needs of the user. For this reason, designers spend 90% of their time before the launch of the effective feature, before the launch of the effective product, instead of be there at the end of this um, scheme that we see before, when the user, where the user are. Maybe some of you are thinking like, wait, we have user research, right? User experience designer, visual designer, or whatever you want to call it in your company right now. Uh, they, they do a lot of user research, they told me about that, they do usability tests, we, we have contact with our user. Well, I'm not saying that doing user research is bad, don't get me wrong, but, um, over the half of the, of the psychology test failed, the rep failed to be reproducible. And most importantly, we cannot just um, think, to think that that data are so easy to read. So in order to really have a good usability test, a good user research, we need to, to have in some, um, some good. And you know, I'm, I'm guilty. I'm guilty to do a lot of this stuff like, um, this one, the, oops, uh -huh. the last one, the post cherry picking of significant resource. This is something that I did in the past with my client. Uh, and now I can realize that, that that was, wasn't really the right thing. The problem is that when we are doing user research in this industry yet, we have this idea of mind to validate instead of explore new idea. And be aware. It's impossible to capture user needs completely until they use the product and their feature in their real environment, in their real situation. That's the only point where we can have like 100% that we can be sorry, 100% sure that what we are building for those people is right. 
what we can have from the usability test in the lab can be, or the more extensive user research can be um, some really good insight that can help us to uh, move forward, especially when we have a lot of doubt. But it's not the end resource, right? We still have these people over there to use it in the real world. So more than our capacity to take decision, the right decision up front, we need to be able to capture uh, learnings and react lab rapidly to that. That means that the quality of our decision are not as important as our ability to learn and to adjust our course while paying as little as possible for learning, adjusting, and mistake. I think a lot of you uh, heard this expression like, oh, we need to fail fast, fail cheap. And of course, it's not easy because here we are talking really to make some uh, baby step uh, to uh, push real code in production as quick as possible and be able to go back to the previous environment as, as quick as possible in order to make experiment. This idea, you know, the um, fails fast, fail cheap is coming from Lean uh, Startup, as I think most of you know. And what is also really popular right now is the idea of Lean UX. But in general, it's always something like that, right? So you have an idea, you think, you make something, most of sometimes a prototype, you check it and iterate in this circle. And this is good, and a lot of people right now are super excited by this uh, Google Design Sprint uh, that in five days you can do there, you can make everything, and you have the right decision. And it's not so easy, right? You just have to have one people in one room for one week, and you have the, uh, you're going to have the right solution in the end. Well, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical about that. First of all, because I heard um, people starting to do this more as a, a team building activity, which is not. <laughs> or people be proud to say like, we do a Google the Sound Sprint in three days. That's not the point, it's not a challenge. Um, and it's really a pity because I still believe there is some value, right? There is some value in uh, check with the user as, as soon as possible. Um, there is some value in having a, a prototype, so spending as less as time as possible to be something that actually works. But it's not by doing one Google Design Sprint next to another that you're going to have the right solution, especially because, as my friend before really liked to say, running one experiment is easy. What is hard is running experiment at scale. So imagine this idea of having uh, two features that you want to push in, the, in your in in your new product. And for these two features, you're starting to create three experiments, and then you're having them compete one against each other in the product, in production. That's hard, right? That sounds crazy. And maybe um, some of you are already familiar with the concept of DevOps. Raise your hands. Oh, awesome, all of you. So I can really go quick on this, well, more or less. Um, <coughs> so, uh, what really is cool about this idea of DevOps is that, first of all, it's not just developer operation, but it's all the things that make possible for us to really be agile and to really live in a, in a time where people um, can push code and see your reaction uh, and see the results of your code in front of you as soon as possible, and that's amazing. It kind of gets us free to the idea of deliver software by CD. I remember that um, Photoshop used to be like, you know, you have the CD, you have the box, and that was really different. It actually changed completely the way that we, did, that we distribute digital product. And as we said before, software is all around us. So it was really, this was really the big change. And what I found super interesting about the idea of DevOps is that it introduced this concept of the delivery team, which is a team who is able to know so well the product and that specific feature because it's on it since the beginning, so since the first iteration, iteration zero, until the end, until the retirement of that feature, if it's going to be. 
And this creates this, this mantra, they say, you build it, you run it. And that's the effort because um, this delivery team is going to be surrounded by dashboard, is going to really to receive the feedback by the, by the environment in front of you and is, so, and is able to monitor the quality and actually, right now, uh, to predict. We can kind of say that the real job of the DevOps is to observe the product, is to create in this uh, feeling of familiarity with it that it actually help us to have in this feedback from the production. And what, was, what happened here is that we have in a sort of a loop, right? We have this infinite loop between the machine that tells something to us, tell us information, tell us um, how is our server, is the user uh, using the feature, is the, um, the ship that we just did, it, the, uh, the build uh, fail or not, and it's able to give us back this information. And if we are able to incorporate this feedback in our process, we actually create we can use it as a design loop. We can actually use this feedback as an input to the design phase. And here where I want to introduce this idea of design ops as a continuous conversation, a continuous conversation with who exactly? Well, of course, with our customers, but also with the rest of the company and also with the rest of the delivery teams that we have in the company. So how, how does it work? It's a two-way conversation, a dialogue between creator and user based on fast feedback loop. And unfortunately, it's based on having cheaper software in the product. And I know it's expensive because that means that sometimes we may be able to push something that doesn't work or that for um, a couple of weeks it's going to have a drop. But um, I still believe, and I'm not the only one, that this is the best way to have in the best feedback. And we, we believe that this is necessary to minimize the effort to plan and create a product and feature to collect feedback from the user in the real world. So what we're going to do is to uh, minimize the effort to pushing code in, uh, in the world in order to maximize the feedback from the real user. And I think that in the future, we're going to have some situation like um, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms uh, helping us to make this decision even easier, to helping us understand the data around us even uh, in a faster way and maybe to predict it. Uh, but there's already something that we can do right now, uh, especially if we see uh, these two directions. So the first thing that we can do is to be sure that we have a structure in our company who, is, who can help us to automate as much as possible the design decision. And the second part is on the uh, organizational area. <coughs> Sorry. So what is the first, the first thing that comes to your mind if I say automate design decision? None of you? It's easy. The sense. Huh? Yeah, that was basically uh, when we were talking about here, right? That we, if, if, if we ship, um, if we have shippable code in the software, we can actually be able to run some kind of experiment. One of it, one of it can be A-B testing. This is something that is already um, I open a lot of company right now, but the idea of design decision, what I meant with that is that all the information around it. So for me as a designer, the first step is to have in a design system. And a design system is nothing else than a product. It's not a project. It's not something that one day you say like, okay, we finish our design system, let's move on. It's something that you have to put the resources on it. You have to have some dedicated resources, more important. and. This is a product who is serving all the products. And for me, that's the perfect, um, the, the perfect thing. And how many of you in, in this room have a company like that work for a product who has an established design system? A few. And um, 
it's something similar to having a partner library or a style guide. However, for me, it's a bit um, different because it's, it's more a matter to having a language, a common language that you can speak in your organization. And it really helps us to make the right choice, the easiest cho choice. And it avoids the run of the designer against the developer. Say like, oh, two pixels off. That's, that's not something that is if you have all the design decision, all the design information in just one place. And for me, the design system, more than consistency, which, I mean, I think we can discuss later if they really help the user. I never heard in 10 years a user say, I love that everything looks the same in the product. They, they don't care about that. More that, they care about having a cohesive experience. They care about um, having some... Um, uh, the expectation uh, met, and you can do that if you have a product to speak the same language everywhere. What I mean with the language, as I said before, I mean um, behavior. So what happens uh, uh, when you you have a form and you send the form? You can have multiple form in your in your product. Those form should be able to have an ecosystem way to communicate to the user. They should behave the same. And this can be different, especially if you're in an organization where you're working with feature team that compete against theirself. Or that's sort of the story that uh, my friend, the consultant one, told me. Um, and how can you do for convince your boss so to, to build a design system, to having some dedicated resources on it? Well, for me, the first uh, point is that it, sens it sensibly reduce the time necessary to create it different pages. So that A-B testing, we were talking before, the ideas of experiment to having different features that can really kind of compete against each other. If you already have a language where you can build on it, it's pretty, it's pretty easy. Um, most importantly, for a more um, process perspective, it enables other people to design. Uh, many designers are working more and more with the idea of supporting others, right? And I think what, what is super interesting is that right now as designer, we're actually able, instead of focusing on design the same button over and over, to build tools, tools that can help people to take this decision by themselves, especially because most of the time you, you don't always have a designer available, right? You don't always have somebody who can solve your problem or you don't need it because you already have the, the information somewhere stored. And when we're talking about tools, we're also talking about the idea of getting all the icons that you need and be able to choose for uh, which platform you need. I'm in Firefox, we're facing this problem, like working on the design system for it, is that we want to be cross We are cross-platform, right? Our products serve different platform. So it's becoming even more challenging to understand how can we serve this information to the people. And there is this company, maybe you heard about it, Airbnb, who they're like, they're going even further. They're actually building some tool, like they have a problem with localization for them is, um, really important to be sure that their design works in every language, it doesn't have any break. So what they're doing here is that they call in the JSON with all the um, string from the translation and put it in this web page that they can just load the whole the, uh, the layout and see how it looks in different languages. That's pretty cool. That's actually going to save a lot of time to uh, the QA people to test it later. And that's what I call a design infrastructure. And the design infrastructure is amazing, right? Because it allows people to be really be uh, 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 autonomy and to take decisions by their own without having somebody to micromanage them. And it assures the quality across the, across the platform. So it's not that people are taking decisions by their own, uh, ignoring what else is around them, but they actually all speak in the same languages. They actually all using the same components. And this sounds pretty cool, right? So if you have a design system, I don't know, you're able to have in all the colors here and you're set. Well, that's what we were hoping, but then we realized that we still have designer uh, shipping documentation through um, InVision. This is like a really complicated InVision file or 
of course, we have Sketch because some developer, especially on the front end side, is like, you know, don't, don't worry, I'm confident with that. Just send me the Sketch file or the Photoshop or whatever you use. Or there, there is like a tool on GitHub that you can just inspect. I mean, there are plenty of these, like uh, Avocado, something like that, that you can just go here and inspect them in all the, the measure one by one. So, okay, that's, that's a bit. There is a lot of conflict here because we don't have any more. This one is a Slack message, a Trello card on Trello, of course. And then there's our own private um, tool. It's called Bugzilla, which is also have a really um, peculiar UI. And it's, as you can see here, we have all the uh, reference. And that's really hard because we are missing this unique source of truth. We thought that having a design system will help us, right? We have all the documentation there. We have the uh, vocabulary for our new language. Why is it not working? It's not working uh, because it's still not the easiest choice, right? It's, it's still not the easiest way to communicate this information to people. And that was the main point before. We have to make the right, the right decision, the easiest decision to take. And that's why I would like to talk to you for the next couple of minutes about the idea of design tokens. Design tokens are nothing else than um, an ab abstraction where we can put our design decision, for instance, color, and then propagate to all the system. Let's see how it, how it works a bit better. So as I say, we have the design decision and let's say color. We create a JSON file and then we have a script which um, automatically create the uh, XML for Android or uh, some tokens as variable for the web. And if we are working in a complex environment like uh, Firefox, where we also have to serve iOS, we're pretty good because iOS just take the JSON, so that was easy. And then what is really cool is that from this JSON, we can also move on and generate the sketch color palette. So if we need to have somebody still building a, a mockups or wireframe using the real color, we just have this point where we have all the design decision collected and then have it in sketch, in keynote, or uh, in the design system website. Because if we are going to use the, uh, the CS variable, we can transform it in an NPL module that then other teams, including myself, can use and implement it. This also meaning that if we realize that the one shade of blue is not really accessible from the user perspective, we can just change it here and then it's propagated to all the products. And then I think that's pretty cool because we can kind of ignore what we say before about all the different file documentation because this is the point where everything is real. And why is real? Because this is actually what we're going to put in, the, in production. And of course, it's also future friendly because who knows when the next uh, hot things is going to be out and what kind of language is going to take. If we have in this decision small enough and abstract, it's going to be pretty easy to figure out a way um, to propagate this information to, to it as well. And that's how we look. So we have the JSON and we use the variable in the product and that's how it looks in a whatever Apple product you want, in this case, Keynote. And I suggest to you, if you're interested, to start with color and type because it's the um, really the most easy information, but then just not stop with that you can then start to combine different tokens and having more uh, complex um, element like components. And um, it really leaves us as designer a lot of time to focus on what really matter and what really, <laughs> what really matter in this case is making your design more accessible. A lot of people still think that um, working for uh, having your design accessible is just provide an alt text and be sure that you have enough color contrast. There is way more that we can do on that side and there is uh, way more literature that we can really focus on it. Or we can make our design more future friendly and focus on that performance that we said before. Are you sure that what you have it is really performant? Well, if you, instead of building um, 
the same form over and over, just a bit different, you can really focus on it and implement it, then the second iteration of that form, which is going to be propagated in all your product, is going to be more performant, it's going to be more accessible, it's going to be more resilient, it's going to be easy to, um, it's going to be more easier if you put in, I don't know, in a layout full width or just in a sidebar, how this component react, how does it change? And we can also spend some time for doing some uh, bit, uh, a bit of delightful stuff like a micro interaction or animation that's most of the time we don't have time to implement that because we are always building new stuff over and over. But if we kind of stop for a second and have the time to iterate what we are doing instead of reinventing the wheel, well, we have it. And most importantly, we are now removing uh, the time you know, to rethink about all this stuff. So we can focus on having a conversation with the user because our product is going to, to meet the user way faster than before. And that allow us to really um, understand what they need and improving on it. As we said before, like the, the sign ups motto was a DevOps motto was, uh, you build it, you run it. So I would like to think about this idea of uh, a design ops motto, which is, you run it, you design it. I have this idea of this product team be able to design and to ship design in production without having a, design, a designer on board all the time. And for doing that, you also need to have some dedicated time to think about the feedback, because one way, one easy way to collect feedback, of course, is setting up Google Analytics or whatever you use, and you do some event and you see if people react to it. That's definitely good, but also think a bit more like, can you, can you make something that people can react to you and kind of get in the feeling? As I said before, like what is really important about DevOps is that they're able to realize before the before the machine tell you like, like hey your test is broken that something that something is wrong and I think that um, the product team using the this the sign ups attitude it can be able to do the same so setting some small question and of course uh, meeting with them in real life I'm pretty lucky because uh, working on the design system means that my uh, first kind of user are the, all the people that are, that are working in Mozilla. So I can have the occasion to meet with them and talk with them. <coughs> and um, that's pretty cool. And you can actually have a lot of uh, nice full insight. But maybe you notice here, like here there was already a version of the product. So it's not that we're like talking, 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 talking without working. Like we actually was, we were putting information in front of them and ask if it was useful for them and how it was useful for them. Because we believe that the goal of a, a company, of course, is to meet your business uh, uh, goals, but also to delight the user. Because if the user is not um, happy and is having a successful relationship with your browser, or sorry, browser, lapsus, with your product, of course it's going to leave and of course it's going to um, go to your competitor. So right now we have everything automated. So uh, what we have left, and I'm a bit out of time. So we are thinking about, we, have, we do all the automation and now we are missing the uh, organizational part. As I said before, I imagine that we have a product team which is cross-functional, end-to-end um, value of creation. So if it's a feature team, it's going to be on that feature from the beginning until the end. And that means that they're going to become um, the main expert. And it may or may not include a designer. And this product team um, works in a, we can say, an agile way, in an iterative way. Whatever your pro uh, process is, it's just important that you're able to create this loop, this circle. So your team is thinking about some experiment that today you can push in your production environment. You have it all the experiment here competing again against each other. And this actually creates some co create You have some uh, value given from the response of the user. So somehow your user are designing with you the feature 
in a in a way that they maybe don't even know because all the time that they interact with one of those experiments, they actually send you a feedback. Uh, but of course, those people are not, are not alone. Those people are um, guided by a strategy. It's coming from the stakeholder. It's coming from the management. And they give a promise to the team that, in change, give a feedback. So if the purpose of the of this strategy is not actually met when the user use the product, it's good that the product team can say, like, there is something wrong with our strategy. We should maybe iterate on it. And for doing that, we have all the automated design decision given by uh, the design ops. Uh, what I really like to just underline here is that it's a pull, it's not a push. So it's the team who is able to go to the design ops uh, people and take what they need in order to build those experiments, in order to actually shape the product. And the design ops team, uh, from my perspective, includes designer, developer, data analysis. It can have a product manager for help to manage all the other products. And it provides the design infrastructure, so all the tools, including the design system and observe the organization uh, design need. So it, it talk with the teams, but it also then ideate some solution for the whole organization in order to scale up the solution to all of them. And whatever we have in mind, like this is something I think uh, pretty new and I, I really love to hear more from you about it. What is something that always come in is the idea of governance. So who is going to take the decision? Uh, how can we interact with people on our uh, daily basis? Uh, who has the last word? Is the product team? Is the design ops team? I don't know the answer. There is no uh, magic uh, recipe that works for all, unfortunately. Uh, otherwise, we can all do the science sprint one next to another and be sure that our product is going to be super successful. What I can give it to you as a giveaway is a sort of um, uh, idea. So the idea of that as a designer and as a developer working for a product, so meeting the user, we need to remember to design for learning, design for those experiments, be as flexible as possible, and remember to validate our idea and our hypothesis as soon as, um, as soon as possible and in the real world. That's because markets are complex and are predictable. And the real, uh, the real ability of a good and effective team is not the quality of their code, but is their the ability to adjust and to change, to steer the wheel and to move into the right direction. We want to be uh, we want to work in an organization where everybody is able to design because people are already taking the same decision. So as designer, we should give to them all the tools in order to make it in the in the right way. Design is everybody's job. And launching a new feature is just the beginning of a continuous design process. Uh, we should use the moment that the feature met the user as the beginning of design, not just as the end and moving on another feature. And this is it. Thank you.